I'm now going to introduce you to our keynote conversation session. So in this session, you're going to hear from the five directors of the A Better Start Partnerships, and they're going to talk to us about the context within which A Better Start has been creating change, share some of the key learning and the priorities for the future. We're really pleased that the discussion today will be facilitated by Elliot Ray, and some of you may have heard or seen Elliot. Um, he is the founder of the parenting platform Music Football Fatherhood, which has been called the Mums Net for Dads by the BBC. Elliot is the curator of the best-selling book Dad, presenter of BBC One documentary Becoming Dad, co-founder of the Working Dads Employer Awards and creator of the Parenting Out Loud campaign, which encourages working dads to be equal and active parents. With all of that experience, we've asked Elliot to tell you a bit more about his work first, and then he's going to introduce you to the five A Better Start directors. So over to Elliot, and wonderful to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. And I completely echo your thoughts. Watching that video was really emotional. I thought I've got to get myself together to actually speak and talk because, you know, hearing about the parents um, that were preparing for, for parenting and the impacts the services would happen having on helping them to think about their relationship and and food and the video at the end of the lady with uh, the child with additional needs and the support that she's has received is it's incredible and i think it really just brings home while we're talking the impact of the work so i want to first of all say a massive well done uh, and thank you to everybody that's been involved you are changing lives and the impact that your work has is immeasurable you know, I started my platform from a, a traumatic birth experience. My daughter was very sick when she was born. And for me, when I look back, the support that I could have had from uh, the, the work you're doing, from the Better Start program and those, those networks, they really would have been so powerful for me and my family. And I think that's part of the reason why I started my own platform, Music Football Fatherhood, to kind of plug some of those gaps. Um, so we engage dads around open conversations about fatherhood and over the years we've had some amazing contributors and also some amazing um, media support that's helped us to turn what was a small blog that I was just doing in the middle of the night feeding my baby um, to now being a platform that supported thousands of dads across the UK. We had The Rock, Dwayne Johnson himself sharing our work and that really helped to platform and spotlight the work we were doing. Um, so now we concentrate on three main things through Music Football Fatherhood. We do a lots of work around online group therapy. It's, it's completely free to access for dads. We partner with loads of different football clubs um, like Arsenal and Southampton and Leicester and the best team in the world, Queen's Park Rangers. I would say I'm a QPR fan. You can feel free to disagree with that. <laughs> we partner with these football clubs to create safe spaces for dads. Um, and we also do events called Dads Do Hair as well, which I'm going to talk a little bit more later on too. We think about doing things differently uh, and I think it is really important and I'm a big champion for change and actually thinking about how do we evolve and how do we do things differently through our services. I don't think it's just a nice to have, I think it's actually essential for us to create and sustain and build interventions that are going to make impact to our customers, which in our world is our parents and our carers and our children. We live in an evolving world, the cost of living, COVID, AI, social media, and doing things differently is actually about adapting and evolving to how the world is changing and making sure we are putting in place systems and processes and services to serve our families. But it can be challenging to do things differently. And it's quite easy to stick to what we know in our comfort zone, to how we have always done things. But I would say that if we always do what we've already done, we're going to get the same results. See, Music Football Fatherhood has been in evolution. We have tried so many different things over the years. We started as a blog, we've done online Twitter debates, we had a podcast, we run family fun days. And the constant evolution has meant that we have had to adapt. We've had to get new people on board. We've had to partner with new organizations. We've had to get feedback from our audience and understand what's actually working and what's not working. 
We've had to trial different models of funding and delivery. And that's been a learning experience for myself and my team, but something that we embrace as not just you know, okay and, and, and good to do, but actually important for us to stay relevant and make sure we are really hitting home and having the impact that we can have. So I wanna talk about two pieces of work that we do, which I think are quite innovative. And we've had to change quite a lot in regards to how we think uh, and the behavior change that we're hoping to get from our, our dads that we engage with. So the first I wanna talk about is Dads Do Hair. Now Dads Do Hair events are incredible. I actually have such a laugh hosting them. <laughs> Uh, we get dads together to learn how to do their children's hair. Now, this started from me having a young child myself eight years ago. And for obvious reasons, I never really needed to learn how to plait or do a bun. <laughs> Before COVID, I didn't have any hair. This is COVID hair. And then I have a young child. And it was my turn to do the nursery run. My, my wife's at work. It's, it's my turn to do the nursery run. And I'm in the mirror with her in the bathroom. And I'm panicking because I know I don't really know what to do. So I kind of do a little bun, I get her to, to nursery and I'm a little bit embarrassed because I know it's not as good as when mummy does it. And in talking to other dads, I realized it's not just an Elliot problem. It's not just a me problem. This is a dad problem. And actually we need to do something to try and address how dads can learn to do their child's hair. Cause it's a really important part of parenting. Now we champion uh, breaking down gender parenting roles. We want equal parents. We want dads to be doing more. And that means new responsibilities, including being able to do their child's hair for the school run or nursery run. So when we do these sessions, we partnered with a healthcare specialist and we market them as you know, incredible events to first of all, learn a life skill, but also a really good opportunity to meet other dads and have really immersive conversations. We do them in church settings, um, in workplace, in employers, in community groups, and they're incredible. And when we do them, we have three stages. The first stage is the entry level, and that's the ponytail or a bun. So everyone can do that. All the dads get involved. That's fairly easy to do. Everyone can get involved. And then we're going to the intermediate level, which is a free strand plait. Um, and yeah, most dads can do that. I would say most, most dads can do that. Some are really expert. Blue Peter, they've done it before. They do a great job. And then we get to the expert level, which is a French braid. And that's where I go and sit down and have a cup of tea. <laughs> but they're really, really good. And for me, in thinking about how we have done those events, it was about us thinking differently. It was about us thinking about what do dads need to, need to learn? What is the demand? How do we work with different partners? How do we have different conversations? How do we think differently about where we advertise and how we advertise? And in Rose running those sessions, how do we also think differently about how we create a space where those dads are shoulder to shoulder, first of all, doing an activity, but then we move them face to face for the conversation around gender roles and equal parenting. So really, really good. And I would really encourage you to think about when you're putting on dad's events, how can you do things that are for dads specifically and helping them to learn life skills like dads do here, like nutrition, like first aid. You know, what in my experience I've learned that really dads went to upskill. And so what you can do to provide those learning opportunities is really powerful. The second I'm going to talk about is our Parenting Out Loud campaign. So Parenting Out Loud is when we encourage dads to be loud and proud about their caring responsibilities at work. And also we work with employers to help them build workplace cultures where dads can be loud and proud about their caring responsibilities at work. We know from research, historically, dads are very unlikely to talk about their, their, their parenting needs at work, but we know 85% of dads from the State of the World Fathers Report want to spend more time with their children. Work and inflexible work, lack of paternity leave, we have one of the worst paternity leave packages in, the UK, in, in Europe, can be a major barrier for dads being equal and active parents. We know one in five dads can't afford to take any paternity leave whatsoever. So we launched this campaign to really help build workplaces where dads can be loud and be proud. And in us doing this, we had to think differently. We actually started uh, with a billboard campaign across the TFL. We funded it ourselves. And for us, for us, this was about how do we attack this problem in a different way? How do we start a, a national conversation about dads and work? How do we use different methods to communicate this idea? And how do we be innovative and try something that might not work, but it might work? And how do we take a risk and do things differently? So we funded a billboard campaign and that has really, really kicked off. And I'm so proud to say it's discussed on Loose Women last week. It's been on the news. It's been featured on the Princes of Wales Royal Foundation website, Champion Our Work. And it started a nationwide conversation 
on LinkedIn with hundreds of dads sharing their own stories. If you go on LinkedIn and search parenting out loud hashtag, you will see loads of dads sharing their stories about working flexibly, taking paternity leave, putting in their in their um, calendars at work, the school pick up or school drop off. And it's really, really resulted in a behavior change, a real behavior change for what dads are doing. And it's created a new in-group of dads that are saying, no, actually, we want to have flexibility in our work. We want to be loud and proud about our caring responsibilities at work. And I'm so proud that the campaign has resulted in that behavior change. But it did mean us having to think about things differently, how to fund things differently, how to use new marketing methods and really take a risk and not know whether it's going to work or not. But I really think that's what we need to do. The world is evolving. How do we evolve with it, take calculated risks, um, get feedback from our customers and really implement some amazing work like you're already doing to have a fantastic um, immeasurable impact on families' lives. So I'd really, you know, as we're talking through with the directors, we're going to have a great conversation. Yeah, really challenge yourself to think about what can you do to push the service and really influence your sphere of influence in your family or your workplace and your communities. So we're going to have an amazing conversation with um, the directors of the A Better Start program. And I'm so proud and privileged to be able to host this conversation. I'm going to ask them all to introduce themselves, um, say a few words about who they are and what they do. And then we'll get into the meat of the conversation. So I'm going to ask um, Claire, Claire Law from Blackpool Better Start. Um, please introduce yourself, Claire, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, lovely to be here. Uh, my name's Claire Law. I am the director of the Better Start programme in Blackpool. and really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Claire. Jill Thornton, Better Start Bradford, over to you. Hi, Elliot. That was really good to listen to. Um, we absolutely love the work we do with our dads. I'm Jill Thornton. I'm the director at uh, Better Start Bradford and I've been with the ABS programme for a long time. Thank you, Jill. Okay, Laura McFarlane um, from Lambeth Early Action Partnership, aka LEAP. Hi everyone. Hi Elliot. That was really great to hear about your work. Uh, my name is Laura McFarlane. I'm the director of LEAP uh, down in Lambeth and I've worked in Lambeth for a very long time uh, and was uh, here at the start of the programme. Thank you, Laura. Carla Capstick uh, from Small Steps, Big Changes in Nottingham. Welcome. Thanks, Elliot. And yeah, great to hear about your work. And I'm hoping to uh, provide some examples um, through the discussions today around some of the work we've done around fathers as well. But yeah, I'm the programme director at Small Steps, Big Changes, SSBC for short. Um, I've been with the programme since 2018. So been quite a significant part of this journey and really looking forward to today's conference. Thank you, Carla. And last but of course not least, uh, Nia Thomas, a better start, South End. How are you doing, Nia? Good morning. I'm great. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's great to be here with, with so many people and yourself, Elliot. I'm Leah Thomas and I'm the director at A Better Start South End, South End on Sea. And I guess I'm probably the newest member of the directors group, but certainly not new to early years. So really looking forward to this morning. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us. So let's get into the first question. I'm really interested to get your thoughts on, you know, what does behaviour change really mean? And how do we and should we be talking about behaviour change in the context of the work that we do? Um, so, Jill, I'll come to you first. What, what are your thoughts around this? Thanks, Elliot. <clears throat> I think that what we're looking for is for the way that um, we parent our children and the way that we work together in the community to, to raise our children is, is in their best interest and works best for them. And sometimes we need to do things differently. And so what we're trying to do is support the change that, 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 that our children need in order to do the best they possibly can. And one of the things that we've been able to do in our programme, partly because of the underpinning and partly because of the resources and the time that we've got, is to really get to understand how that works and work alongside parents so that we understand how it works for them and, and, and what it means in terms of response to their needs. And so I think that's that's what we mean by behaviour change. It isn't about telling people to do things differently and then expecting them to, to, to sort of obey that, but, but really work together to see how that's, that process can be supported. And, and, and I think that's, that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about all day today, 
is that it isn't just about the parents, it's about how the parents fit into the local communities and and who they're working with and 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 you know what decision makers do to respond to to the needs of our children. I couldn't agree more. I think that that feedback loop and the continual conversation is so important for understanding how our, how our work is landing. Um, Carla, what, what are your thoughts on on this? Yeah, I think to for, for me, behaviour change and or we talk about systems change as well in a better start, which is kind of like how do we how do we work collectively across our partnership to really think about the systems that might hold a particular issue in the place that it's in. And it's a very diverse subject area. I do think it means different things to different people, but it certainly requires us to think differently, to behave differently, to be different and to do different things as well. Um, I often talk about engaging heads, hearts and hands in order to really bring about that change um, at multiple levels. And in SSBC, we've taken quite a sort of multifaceted approach to this and utilised some evidence-based frameworks, things like the behaviour change wheel um, and the water of systems change to help guide our work. And I think it's probably best if I talk about that thinking, being and doing by providing an example. So I'm going to touch on our work with fathers. Um, so we set an ambition to be father inclusive in SSBC. And we knew that to achieve that would require significant behaviour change from fathers and male carers, particularly around their expectations from services and what they felt they could ask for, what they could ask the hope to, to gain, but also from workforce, from services, and then that wider system change from commissioners and decision makers, both at a national and local level. So the kind of things that we've done is we've promoted father inclusivity by leveraging our resources in a whole range of ways. We've thought about engagement focused on relationships um, and connections and power dynamics with fathers and the workforce. And that's led to the co-production of a father's pack, a new pack for dads called the Dads Pack locally. And it's a fabulous resource that dads have helped design alongside practitioners. We've thought about changes in our service provision and our practice, and we've worked at delivering father inclusive services alongside services that are specifically tailored to fathers, as you mentioned in your opening intro. We've thought about how can we make changes to the environment as well, and where can we provide resources? And we've done that by providing 133 recliner chairs to our NUH trust locally, so that partners, fathers, male carers can be there with their partner at birth while they're pregnant and while they're in hospital in that antenatal um, period. We thought about how we support with education and training for the workforce. We've developed Think Dads training locally. We've delivered training, conference and webinar series. We've also thought about awareness raising as well and marketing and comms and developed a local Think Dads campaign just to keep that in the back of people's minds and to really keep people thinking about fathers. And then we've used, I guess, our leverage and our power and our regulations isn't maybe quite the right word, but we've made sure that there are statements for every single one of our commission providers that they will think about father inclusivity in the work that they do with us when we're commissioning them. We've also piloted um, guidelines. So we provided some father friendly service standards, which are now being um, piloted in our family hubs locally. And then finally, we've kind of thought about how we can influence policy as well. We're a much smaller uh, partnership and organisation, but we have presented written and oral evidence at a health and select social care committee earlier this year on men's health. And finally, we've kind of looked at our relationships and connections with other fathers groups and thought leaders in, in this area. There's still a lot more to do, without a doubt, to kind of bring about that long lasting behaviour change and to really shift those heads, hearts and hands. But I think, again, we've created new dialogue. We've created new expectations and new practice locally that just simply wasn't there nine years ago. And most importantly, local fathers have helped us shape that. And I'm really proud of that work. Incredible. That is music to my ears, Carla. <laughs> Incredible work. And what I really like is the holistic nature of it. You know, it's not a one and done. It's looking at the whole process, the partnerships, the feedback, the, the journey of, of, of parenting and fatherhood. So incredible work. Thank you for sharing that example. Um, Nia, I'm going to come to you on this same question as well. Any thoughts? So for us, behaviour changes, it's firstly about creating that environment where people can come, they can feel welcomed. And in creating that welcoming environment, it, it also means that the professionals, they're adept at building trusting relationships with parents. And those, those relationships are non-judgmental and they really open up opportunities for conversations about strengths, individual goals or family goals. 
And I think supporting parents to develop their knowledge and skills, whether that's about infant feeding or child brain development, the influence of, of play on learning or parental mental health, all that is founded on that initial confidence that we can instill um, in parents that we're safe and trusted professionals who support and nurture them to achieve what they want and I think Jill said it earlier it's not about doing too it's about supporting I think long since uh, have gone the days where, where we were we behaved in that kind of way now we are a supportive uh, community of professionals we often hear our parent champions talking about the impact that confidence building has had on, on their ability to access services in the community and be parent support for other parents that are going through these kind of challenges. Um, so that initial creation of a creating a, of a welcoming environment is both physically and relationally is really important for us. And that means ensuring that the locations of the services are accessible for our families based in spaces and places that they want to attend. And it also means that we need to make sure that our professionals are well trained and skilled in that strengths based practice. Um, for us, particularly our Your Family Service and anybody who's joining the systems breakout group later will hear my colleague Tara talking about this, that parents know they can come back to, uh, to the services when they need to and they're not going to be hampered by having to sit on a waiting list uh, and be referred in. So environment, creating that confidence, creating that trust, really important for us to support behaviour change. Thank you, Nia. And you've nicely taken us on to the next question because you've started to talk a little bit about the conditions. Um, for success and when we think about how we want to create behavior change for our families and our communities that has to start with us and sometimes we have to challenge the way we do things um, that can be uncomfortable but when we get it right we can really create the, the right conditions for us to be successful in changing and adapting our approaches so I want to ask you kind of like what have the key conditions for success been in terms of the ABS approach um, and how specifically have your partnerships helped with embedding these changes. Um, so Claire, I'll, I'll come to you first. Uh, thanks, Elia. Um, yeah, so I think it's a $64 million question, isn't it? Kind of what are the, what are the conditions for change? Because we want to be able to replicate this. We want to, you know, scale the Better Start approach right across uh, the UK and, you know, internationally, to be honest. Um, so how do we do that? What do local areas need to put in place to enable that to happen? And there are, you know, so many different things. I think that we often talk about things like data, evidence, you know, having the latest science at your fingertips. But for me, I always talk about Better Start being an investment in transformation. And so, yes, absolutely all those child development outcomes that Phil talked about right at the start are so important. But if we haven't got the right conditions to enable that change to happen, then we're gonna really struggle to improve early child development outcomes. So, so for me, it's about a cultural change. You need to create the right cultural conditions within your local area. So that might be about commissioning things different. That might be about making sure there is that joint vision, there is that joint accountability. Um, it might be about the way we work together. So making sure that co-producing is right at the heart of everything we do, because ultimately, you do need that system that creates the right foundations to enable change to happen. So if I could champion one thing, it would be get your local culture right, get everybody believing in early child development and also childhood now. And I'll talk probably about that a little bit later, but I think often we focus on child development, kind of children's potential. Let's make sure that children actually enjoy their childhoods in, in the here and now as well. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Laura, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, there are lots of ingredients and lots of things that um, are part of our conditions for success. Just to pick up on a couple, we've been really fortunate in the Better Start sites because we've had the opportunity to be evidence informed, but also evidence generating. And I think, you know, the funding that we've had from the lottery has allowed all of us to have a backbone team that is supporting uh, busy practitioners and services to generate evidence, uh, to gather evidence that we can then use that to focus on improving, developing, changing, shaping. So, you know, in, in other you know, conditions, that's not normally the case. 
Uh, in Lambeth, we've brought several evidence-based programmes uh, to Lambeth and really kind of used the uh, skills and capacity within the team to implement them locally. And there's been a lot of talk about, you know, evidence-based programmes and you can't just pick them up off the shelf and bring them to a place. You really need to look at the local conditions and make sure that those programmes and approaches are a good fit for the local population. Um, we've also been able to generate evidence and really, you know, taking that data driven approach by creating theories of change for all of our services and for the programme as a whole. Um, and that has really enabled us to look at how services working together in an integrated way, not just individual sets of services, but how services come together, uh, have an impact and improve outcomes for families and communities. And I think this has been touched on, but I think, you know, very much we have been very intentional about how parents and communities are involved in our programme and that their voices are at the heart of everything that we do. Uh, parents have worked in so many different roles from service design to volunteer befrienders, breastfeeding supporters, food ambassadors, but have also been heavily involved in governance and evaluation. Um, and I think my last point really is that we've had the capacity and the ability to act as a convener for, I mean, you know, with partnership, it's, it, it, you know, that's the part of the governance, et cetera, but the actual, you know, the hands that Carla talked about, you know, bringing practitioners together to share their experiences, to work out how they can best integrate and work together, but also bringing uh, senior leaders, commissioners and service leads uh, together to uh, strengthen and work on the vision. Um, there's lots more, but I think... I <laughs> That's th thank you, Laura. I'm, I'm definitely seeing the theme of data and evidence running through here as well. And I think it's so important for us to have that to really make informed decisions about what we do next. Yeah. Uh, Nia, really, really keen to hear from you on this as well. There are three key things that I think a better start does quite differently. And I think for anybody looking to set up this kind of um, structure or organisational partnership working in the future, it's worth bearing these three, three things in mind. So to start with its partnership and I think that governance structure of Better Start has, has really set in place a number of those strategic partners who are jointly responsible for the effective delivery of the programme. So for us that means uh, City Council, NHS Trusts, Integrated Care Boards, Voluntary Sector, Alliance Police and, and lots of others and I think establishing that organisational commitment uh, from those decision makers and delivery bodies has been really key. Then there's co-production and having worked in the early years and family support sector for, for nearly 20 years, I think the co-production that we do in A Better Start is quite different. I think my previous experience has been that parental engage engagement is more of a, a consultative basis. So we have an idea, we have our preferred proposal and we put it forward to say, do you like this idea or not? But parents and certainly for our parent champions are involved wherever decisions are being made. And that input is valued, considered. And I think we've got to a point where we are able to have very open and transparent conversations and we can talk about what things we can deliver and what we can't. And my third thing is, is exactly what you said earlier and, and echoes what Laura's just said, is about research and evaluation. The intensity of research evaluation and impact is, is on a, really a different level um, to anything else that certainly I've experienced in the, in the early years. Our analysis and evaluation of outputs and outcomes at a population level really gives us that rich data that's influenced the way that we've delivered uh, and adapted um, our services across the last 10 years. But what I also hope is that it creates a rich source of evidence for or future organisations, academic researchers. So I think it, it's really important to, to create that repository of information so people can access it in the future. So those are my three things. Great insights. Thank you. And I think you know, for everyone listening, it's about I hope you're taking notes uh, and thinking about your hope, your own services and maybe reflecting on what is it that you can think about the conditions that you can create to really um, do more amazing work. I want to get into kind of what has changed um, and legacy here. You know, the work we do, we know it has immeasurable impact, I would say, you know, on, on humans, on, on their lives, on parents' lives and children's lives. I'm really interested to hear some examples. You know, what 
what has changed what are the things that you can pinpoint and say we have done that that has made a difference and what would you say is the most kind of significant legacy what is it in five ten years in time you're going to look back and say do you know what we really did that we made an impact there we changed this um so big question uh but i'm gonna go to claire first on this one thank you uh yeah another big question um <laughs> and certainly there are plenty of examples that we could give that all the directors could give of certainly individual kind of interventions or systemic ways of working that have improved early child development outcomes but i think probably what i want to say um harks back to what I said before about the kind of cultural shift and I think it's changing the ways that we do things because the science and the evidence will change in relation to early child development all the time so in 10-15 years we'll be looking at different things there'll be different examples of what's working there'll be new RCTs out there'll be things you know telling us amazing things and so what we have to do is find a way to to adapt and to shift and to be able to bring the latest science and evidence into a local area in a way that feels acceptable and palatable for, for families and I think probably what's changed in in Blackpool in particular and I used to have a colleague that I worked with a long time ago and she would say Blackpool's had more more pilots than Manchester Airport. So we've had lots of things come in for a short space of time. We've decided they haven't worked after a year or two. We've not held our nerve. We've not been brave. We have failed too fast. I know people talk about you've got to fail fast, but I think there's, there's a middle ground because actually if we think that we failed really quickly, then actually we don't hold our nerve and we don't wait and see what actually might happen. And we've seen lots of examples of that kind of come out recently. So I think for us, it's about the triangulation between lived experience and the science and evidence so that we tailor things to meet our local need. I think we're past now kind of pulling interventions off the shelf and dropping them into a local area. So for me, that's a really significant difference that is really tangible in, in Blackpool and, you know, hopefully is felt by our local community. And I can see some of our local community on, on the call and hopefully that, you know, they would echo that and say the same, that it feels like they are involved, their voice matters just as much is this kind of new science and evidence and data that we've now got our fingertips. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Jill in Bradford, let's go to you on the question. <clears throat> I think we're, we're all going to be saying very similar things. And so I would echo a lot of what has been said. But I think one of the things that Claire said is really important, which is, which is having our youngest people in our communities in mind so that everybody thinks early years and everybody thinks pregnancy and, child, and, and early childhood. And, and thinks about what's needed then. And so we don't um, we don't think prevention is something we can just do when we get around to it. We, we, we literally build it in right from the start. And I think, I think we're getting there in Bradford. I think there's still work to do, and I think there will still be work to do when we're not here anymore. But hopefully we'll leave enough of um, an armory of, of things that can be used to do that, including, and probably the most important thing, uh, a, a massive body of parents <clears throat> who've been part of that journey and who are absolutely committed to it and who see their voice as being as important as any of those other voices and their expertise being as a, a great importance. And I think that's one of the things in my view that's been quite unique about the partnership, which will leave a, a legacy, which is which is how how that unique combination of the system leaders, the parents, and our evaluators and our workforce coming together to deliver this programme. Um, and without any, with, with any of those elements missing, it wouldn't have worked as well. And I think that's probably the most important learning that, that we can take from this programme and share because, um, because it just makes that critical difference. And we've, our parents have been involved in, in all of the elements, including the design of our programme, including the governance of our programme, including the learning in our programme. So they've been part of how we've shared the learning with our practitioners. So sitting on platforms, telling groups of practitioners what it means from their perspective as parents. And that's really powerful and it really does impact. And it's the thing often that people remember. Um, but, but also, you, you know, sharing with our director of children's services or, or our local councillors why this is important and why it makes a difference and why their part of the leadership of it is is critical to it so i think i think for me that's that's what it is but um but the other thing that i'd add um is that across our district there's just so much more acceptance now of the importance of doing evaluation doing it very well 
involving the right people in it, making sure that's connected so we're not all doing our own bit of evaluation separately. And there's an initiative called Connected Bradford, which is looking at how you connect all of the things that, that are about childhood, not just early childhood, but, but across childhood, so that, so that we're not missing things and we're also not over, over complicating or duplicating things. Um, obviously, it's still work to do on that. We all want there to be good sharing of, of, of childhood sort of experiences and, and, and childhood data so that we do the very best. But we're working on that really well. And, and we've got the great advantage of having born in Bradford, in Bradford, who've got a cohort study that's been going for a number of years, plus a better start cohort study. So we're able to, and, get, and are currently getting learning from the people who've been part of our programme through the cohort study. And that's such powerful and useful, both data, but also the, the stuff we can use to influence change and to influence what happens. And so all of those things will be there when we're not here. Um, and especially the parents still driving it. Mm, great legacy. Thank you, Jill. Um, let's head over, head over to Nottingham and speak to Carla. Let's hear from you, Carla, around legacy and, and what's changed in Nottingham specifically. Yeah, I think I think choosing a single legacy, as, as colleagues have touched on, is, is really challenging. You know, we've had a decade nearly of uh, work across five very different sites um, with different partnerships, different demographics. So, again, I'm going to touch on a couple of things that I feel have maybe changed in Nottingham, but also potentially what's maybe changed because of a better start. Um, so, firstly, I think colleagues have touched on this around that that body of research and learning, you know, in the previous question and in this one, we've without a doubt had a significant impact on that body of research and learning into what works, what doesn't work in those three core child development outcomes alongside system change. And while the UK is, you know, we've got a huge range of evidence and research when it comes to early years. We're quite renowned in the UK actually for our early years research, but the evaluation into actually implementation of early years interventions has, has lagged behind. And as Laura said, I think in the previous question, that ability for us to take the evidence, take the science, and then try things locally and make sure that they are acceptable and accessible has been a huge, huge opportunity for us. And that test and learn approach has significantly contributed, I think, nationally to that translation of research into practice um, and further builds the evidence base around what actually does work and doesn't work when you try and implement it locally. And I think that's a real positive legacy. In terms of a Nottingham example, I'm going to probably touch a little bit on what Jill and, and Claire have mentioned around that real shift in culture and the real focus on parents and communities being at the heart of our work. I think Nia mentioned this as well, and embedding co-production as a core principle around what we do. I agree. I think this was a relatively new approach 10 years ago, especially around universal um, pregnancy and childhood services. We didn't co-produce in that way. Um, and we've learned so much now um, that, as Phil touched on, it's been shared in family hubs, with public health, in integrated care boards and integrated care systems. And a good example for us, I guess, in Nottingham would be our family mentor service, where we very much placed parents first around the design. Of, and they told us they wanted a paid peer workforce. And we then almost wrapped the evidence and the science base around that in order to create that service. And it's paid us dividends in terms of not only have we seen an improvement in child development outcomes with ASQ scores showing promising um, increases locally, but it's also provided wider social value, which I think, again, a better start has created so much additional social value within, its, uh, within the five sites through local employment opportunities, training, upskilling, our family mentor service particularly drew on the communities that we work with to find that lived experience workforce. And for us, over 30% of those um, staff moved into their first paid role after they'd volunteered with the programme in the first instance. And 7% of them had actually not even been in a paid role prior to joining um, the, the, the SSBC programme as well. And that ripple effect and that legacy that all five of us will have had is quite unmeasurable, I think. And then the final one, and I will be brief around this, Elliot, because I'm conscious of time, and I think this is a this is more across all five of Better Start sites, but I think it's important to stress this because I think sometimes it's overlooked. But there is a huge legacy that we're going to leave behind in terms of the babies, the children, the families, and that bit I've touched on in terms of the communities we've worked with. In Nottingham alone, we'll have worked with, or we have worked with just over nine and a half thousand babies and children to date. So by the and we've employed over 100 staff, we've created over 150 new volunteer roles. 
that's that's significant. But if you look at a better start across the five, that's 75,000 babies and families will have been supported through the grant funding by the time we reach the end of the grant period. And that's comparable to kind of a medium sized town as defined by the Office of National Statistics. So if you look at somewhere near Clare, that's like Morecambe. That's the whole of Morecambe. That's like Dewsbury. It's like Mansfield. It's like Clacton on Sea. I couldn't think of a local one for yourself, Laura, because of kind of the way that London works. But that that's significant, you know, that nationally an entire population of a medium sized town has been changed by a better start. Um, and I think that's phenomenal and that that legacy will continue for years to come. And we won't see some of that until much longer and much later down the line when we're long gone. So, yeah, that's that's a big one for me when I kind of thought about that. Yeah, well, well said. I, I love that um, impact, um, amazing impact. And I think you've all spoken about you know, the, that the evidence and the data and what, and what works. And I think that leads us into our next question. We are in the middle of an election campaign um, and we're in an important that's an important time, a critical time. They're thinking about policy um, within the context of challenges for families. The question I have for you is, how can the learning from ABS be used to support commitments and prioritise investment in the early years? And where do you think policy priorities should be directed? Uh, so Claire Blackpool, what do you think? Um, yeah, and I think other directors have touched on it. We have been able to influence policy over the years since the inception of, of A Better Start. Um, and our learning will continue to, to do this over the over the coming years. For me, there's probably a, a couple of um, key things. And, and one I mentioned earlier, which is about um, policies focusing on children's experiences and childhoods in the in the here and now so there tends to be um a focus more around kind of you know thinking about children's future potential thinking about economic growth all of those things you know um child care getting parents back into work things like that but actually how do we support babies and children's development in the here and now so that they enjoy a, a happy, healthy childhood. And actually, they're then much more likely to go on to achieve their potential and all those things that, that we talk about. Um, but I just think, you know, an, an increased focus on that over the coming years would definitely be, be, be welcome for me. And the other thing I think that maybe sometimes isn't kind of um, as in the spotlight, but certainly for us in Blackpool, and I know the other Better Start sites have got evidence around this, is is the impact that those kind of wider determinants of health have on children's uh, and outcomes and, and development, and particularly things like social isolation. So for us, when we started in Blackpool, you know, we talked about kind of some key critical stresses on parents and how we would tackle them. But social isolation was probably one of the key things that parents identified. And we've all got examples of how we're trying to build those connections with families. There were some really nice examples of that, I think, in the film right at the start as well. Parents talking about how they were helping themselves, how we were reducing stigma and shame, and they were able to go to each other for help because we know that. So I just think there's definitely something for me about increasing those connections. And we have a great army of community connectors in Blackpool that do an incredible job and actually mean that the evidence base interventions that that we implement have the most kind of chance of succeeding because we're getting the right families to them and we're connecting them up through those vehicles so a focus around that for me would also be be really welcome great thank you laura any thoughts yeah and i definitely endorse uh, what claire was saying about the uh, determinant the wider determinants of health i think you know we uh, have worked on you know, shaping and modelling our kind of interventions. But I think from a policy context, we, you know, we mustn't lose sight of the context that young children are growing up in here and now, today, in terms of housing, lack of housing, overcrowded housing, domestic abuse, etc. I mean, you know, the list can go on. It's 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 what's impacting our children and our young children in the places that we are delivering. And I think a kind of policy ask would be to really, you know, factor that in and, and consider that. And you know, the difficulties that we've all encountered throughout the 
programme in terms of COVID and cost of living crisis, you know, we have developed uh, responses to that so that the offer is holistic and linked up across those various agencies. So we have um, an enhanced casework team that work um, with, uh, within a domestic abuse context uh, and really linked in with the children's centre. So just a very small example of how those kind of wider issues uh, we need to pick up on them. Um, I think we really welcome the increased focus on the infant mental health and well-being through the Start for Life funding. I think that this needs to be strengthened and continued and delivered. And, you know, it's really heartening to hear how a Better Start work was kind of referenced in that work. And we are now very much at the kind of foothills of, of expanding that across our areas, etc. Um, I don't want future policy to lose sight of the early years workforce. They have been through, you know, quite a challenging time over the last few years. Um, and, you know, working to make sure that um, services are joined up for babies and children and that, you know, gaps don't uh, open up so that uh, uh, children fall through those cracks. And again, you know, I think not to underestimate the power and value of outreach and connecting activities. We had quite a compelling, um, those of us that worked in Shorestop, we had some quite compelling evidence come through quite recently. And one of the key factors that that pulled out is the value of outreach. You know, family, some families find it very difficult to navigate, a, you know, a complex early year system. And I think the work that we've all undertaken with parent champions and active connectors out there in the community, uh, supporting families to find their way to services, but also to take services to families is, you know, feels like a very underpinning way of, of making sure that all families receive the support that they need. Thank you, Laura. Um, this has been a rich conversation. We've got about one minute left. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm gonna go to a couple of you uh, and just ask you for your call to action. Uh, you know, what what do you think still needs to change? So I'll, I'll go to Jill and then to, to Carla on this question. So Jill, if you can give us a, a summary, what do you think still needs to change? Call to action. Oh, I've got three points and I was, I'm, I was going to talk long, but I won't. I'll be really quick. So better integration across systems and services. Parents are still facing really patchy support with lots of gaps and pathways that don't work and and and, and sort of broken services and, and struggling to get through there should be a so there should be sustained provision built on a strong evidence base and support for trained and skilled and valued practitioners and we shouldn't be reinventing things every time there's a change in leadership or at a national or local level level and and early childhood investment should be a moral imperative we should not see it as a sort of optional extra or something we can do when we can afford it we can't afford not to do it Thank you, Jill. And Carla, last words to you. Yeah, I kind of concur with Jill on some of that. I think primarily that we need to have some widespread acknowledgement and acceptance of the challenges in measuring impact on outcomes um, in pregnancy in early years. There's so many other variables as colleagues have touched on that attribution to a single intervention can be really challenging, um, especially around those interventions that are universally delivered. And it will continue to be a challenge. And I think just to illustrate, we've had nine years to work on this locally. Um, the fund have engaged with two evaluation partners and numerous other academics and think tanks. We've considered things like cost consequence analysis, cost benefit analysis. We've piloted preventonomics. We've had outcomes frameworks, quantitative data, qualitative data, outcomes based accountability. You name it. We've tried to look at how we measure it. And it's extraordinarily hard. We have had success without a doubt. But like Jill said, I think there's still an overfocus on evidence in value for money or return on investment. Um, on just having a good childhood. And I do fully understand why the public sector need to evidence good use of public funds, but having multiple KPIs and monitorizing preventative approaches in this way is just sometimes not helpful at all. I think what we need is long-term cross-party commitment to provide every baby and child with the best start in life by ultimately focusing on those wider determinants, things like child poverty with progressive universal approaches as a core foundation to that. Well said. And can everyone give the directors a virtual round of applause, please? Claire, Nia, Laura, Carla, and Jill. I trust you are giving a virtual round of applause. I can't see you, but I trust you are. Um, thank you so much. Rich conversation, so many insights. Thank you for your leadership and for your team's work as well. Um, incredible and a pleasure for me to facilitate this conversation with you all. So thank you so much. I'll hand back to Claire.